<laughs> All right. Okay. So we will. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started today. I think um, it's good to see you guys out, especially you know, cold and first kind of truly snowy day we've had. Uh, beautiful out. Um, just enough to cover the grass, but not enough to hit the roads, really. So um, one thing next Sunday, being Christmas Sunday morning, we, we have a special service, um, you know, uh, very special. We're going to have uh, an adult choir up on stage and everything. I think being Christmas morning, um, we'll probably not, I think we're going to not have adult Sunday school with it being Christmas morning. I know we're, we got our kids home and you know, things like that. So next Sunday, um, and I'm going to, I'll call, you know, some of the other folks that aren't here and let them definitely know. So next Sunday, no Sunday school. Okay. Everybody just enjoy your morning, come out and, and, and enjoy a beautiful Christmas Sunday church, sun, uh, church service. Um, <clears throat> so uh, with that, uh, we're going to, we're in the uh, chapter 10 of the book of Acts today. Um, we're going to be picking up in verse 9, and we're going to start, be, we're going to be talking about Peter's vision at this point. And uh, before we actually read any of God's word or start talking about it, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll move forward. Father, we just are so blessed, Lord, to be here today, Father, to, to have the fellowship we have with one another but to also have the fellowship that we have with you. And Lord, we know that that is possible because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection, Lord. Father, we just ask now that your Holy Spirit will lead and guide this time. Father, that you will speak. Father, that you will bring inspiration. And Lord, that it be your voice and your thoughts that we hear and see today, Father. We thank you, we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week, uh, we went through the first eight verses of chapter 10, and uh, we kind of had these two different visions that are taking place, and God is sort of weaving this story together, and we even talked about how, you know, we studied how Peter ended up in Joppa at the house of Simon, and, uh, and then, of course, uh, we had this new person, Cornelius, the centurion up in Caesarea, and uh, how there was a vision there with him. And now we're, we're turning back to Peter, and we see that there is a, another vision now that's taking place uh, with Peter. And uh, God is sort of weaving this story together to teach us a, a, a very foundational truth about where we are, uh, in our relationship with the Lord. So we're going to read now um, verse 9. Uh, we're going to read it by itself first and then uh, talk about it a little bit. About noon the following day as they were on their journey and approaching the city. So that, that first part there real quick, that's referring back to the, uh, the men that were dispatched by Cornelius that we talked about last week. So that, that, that's our sort of connection point. Those men, they left that, that day as soon as Cornelius gave them the instruction. We talked, it's about 35, 40 miles or so from Caesarea down to Joppa. So they've made a, you know, a day long journey and they're approaching the city. So about noon the following day as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. So, uh, <clears throat> so here's the men, they're approaching the city, and as this is happening, right at this timing, when, when the, those men are coming, uh, Peter goes up on the roof to pray. Now, uh, one thing to note, that during this time, devout Jews would have had, they would have had prayer times each day. Um, noon was not a sort of standard prayer time. This was something that, that was being done in addition to those standard prayer times that the Jews would have observed. So, you know, Peter, is obviously, he's very zealous for the Lord. So, you know, we don't know how often during the day he would just go off and, and pray and seek the Holy Spirit. 
Um, but at, at any rate, something had led him at noon at this time to go up to the rooftop and begin to, to seek the Lord. Um, so this is our setting now. These men are, these men are coming. Uh, Peter has been prompted. He's had the feeling, whatever. And he's up on the roof. He's, he's in prayer. He's seeking the Lord, just wanting intimacy with him. And then it happens in verse, uh, verse uh, 10. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. Now, noontime, uh, that would have been a very normal mealtime. I think for many of us, even that's lunchtime. You know, we're uh, whatever we've eaten for breakfast prior to starting our day we're probably starting to feel like, hey, we need to eat. Peter was in that same situation. The food was probably being prepared. And he said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to take this time. I'm going to go up and pray. I feel like I, I'm feeling led to do that. And it uses a very interesting word. We've studied this one time before in Acts. Uh, it says that while he was in this prayerful state, he fell into a trance. Um, the, this is from a Greek word, ekstasis, ekstasis, E-K-S-T-A-S-I-S, -E -E ekstasis. Um, this has a, has a very long definition. It's, it's a pretty deep meaning. It doesn't mean some kind of, you know, when you think of, uh, you know, a trance, for instance, in a, a, a Buddhism or a Hinduism, you know, somebody's, you know, they're, they're, they're like this and they're mumbling something like that, you know, and, and it's kind of this mindless state. Um, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, here's the definition of ecstasis. A throwing out of the mind from its normal state. Uh, the alienation of the mind, whether, uh, whether such as makes a lunatic of a man who by some sudden emotion is transported out of himself. So, you know, somebody would have maybe seen him and thought, is he like going crazy or something? Because, you know, it, it's literally like you've lost touch with re what's going on around you. You've lost touch with reality because something is happening internally, you know, your, your vision, what you're hearing, the things that you're seeing and experiencing are no longer reflecting the physical world around you. You know, it's, it's, it's a very deep uh, experience. Uh, although the person is awake, their mind is drawn off of all the surrounding objects. And this is the interesting part and fixed on the divine or supernatural things that the physical cannot see, including images, sounds, and feelings. Uh, these are things that the bodily eyes and ears and the physical senses cannot see and can only be shown by God. So we hear that long definition this is a state of uh, spiritual connection with the Lord that I don't know if anybody's had an experience like that in this room. I can't say that I've had something like this. There, there have been, there have been some times, one, one particular night when I was at uh, probably the lowest point in my life. Um, you know, uh, secret sin had come to the surface and I was uh, in a place where uh, a 14 year long marriage was coming to an end. Like all of these, it was just this bad place. And um, I, I didn't sleep all night. I was there and a friend was praying with me. And for this, this brief moment, every weight that I felt was lifted and it was as though a light was around me and I heard the Lord speak to me. And when I look back on that, 
I like it was like I was not even in that room anymore. You know what I mean? The presence of the God was so heavy. And I could hear his voice, not audibly, but it was like a, a direct input into my senses. And, and <clears throat> I think back to that moment, and there have been some other times, we were on a mission trip once and, and something happened, but uh, when I think about that experience in myself and I, and I read this definition, I think about what's happening with Peter, I start to get a bit of a sense of maybe how he's feeling about this, what's going on. Um, <clears throat> and so Peter's focus as a result of this, it's, there's nothing in the physical world that he's focused on at this point. Um, he, he is wholly focused on the, the spirit of God right now. Um, and he, he begins to have this vision and we're going to read the details here going into verse 11. But before we do that, want to note that what we're about to read with Pete, with Peter, is an entirely different type of vision than what we read uh, about with Cornelius. Remember it said that Cornelius also had a, a vision. Um, Cornelius, he was spoken to um, in, in just a, a very direct, literal way. I mean, he was given these instructions, you know, there, there is a man in Joppa staying at a, a man's house and you are to send two men or you know some men to go and and get him and bring him to you that is that's a direct you know uh, direct meaning just the same as if i were to say barb pick out a tissue from that and 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 walk it up to me there's it's not like the tissue is a you know a symbol of the presence of the holy spirit and you know literally get the tissue out of the box and bring it. And, and this, that's, that's what happened with Cornelius. God gave him these direct literal instructions. What we're going to see with Peter, though, is a, a entirely symbolic vision. And uh, in some ways, um, you know, Jesus often taught and, and spoke in parables, uh, providing an allegory to something spiritual uh, by painting an image of something else. You know what I mean? That, that's sort of the, the, the definition of a parable. And in some ways, Peter's vision is very similar to a parable. It doesn't actually really have anything to do with, it's, it's a lot about food, but it's not really talking about what Peter can or cannot eat. It's, it's symbolic of something much deeper. And so, God can speak to us in a variety of different ways when we're open and we're in tune with him. And so we're going to move into this vision. Verse 11, we're going to read verses 11 through 13, actually, as a, as a group here. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, get up, Peter, kill and eat. So here is Peter. He's in this trance. He's having this otherworldly experience of, of seeing what God is putting uh, into him. And he sees this thing that is described as a sheet. The Greek word here is othone, O-T-H-O-N-E. And a thone, though described as a, uh, a sheet, when we think of a sheet, I immediately think of a, a bed, and you put the sheet on the bed. Um, and, and a thone was a large piece of fine white linen. So this, you know, this would have been top quality linen. It would have been normally used to create women's clothing. That was, a white was one of the, the colors that many women would have worn. Um, in their dress. So this, this, was, this would have been a large piece of fabric uh, that, that would have looked like that beautiful white fabric that would have been used to make women's clothing. And it was apparently a square or a rectangle of some type. It wasn't circular or oblong or anything because it's described as having four sides. It has four corners. 
And, you know, we can kind of see these maybe like almost ropes or something attached to each corner. And, uh, you know, this, this thing is being let down by the four corners and it, it comes out and it just spreads in front of Peter. Um, <clears throat> Peter is perplexed by this because uh, as he see, I, I would think he would be, I mean, I think I would be too if I'm watching this piece of fabric come down and then suddenly when it unfolds, there's a bunch of animals on it. You know, uh, it, it says all kinds of four-footed animals, reptiles, and birds. Um, the, the, the word all kinds is, I think, important. It's a very simple Greek word, P-A-S, pas. And uh, pas is, uh, it, it means inclusive or every, every kind, um, all represented here. So what does that tell us? Um, uh, that there were definitely animals on this that were considered clean, but there were definitely animals and, and creatures that were considered unclean. Um, <clears throat> now, the entire chapter of Leviticus 11 is dedicated to nothing more than telling us what uh, varieties of animals, what even specific types in those varieties in some cases are clean and unclean. And uh, Peter uh, clearly is a devout Jew. You know, he, he is somebody that, that would have known. Uh, in, in fact, here in a minute, uh, it's stated that, you know, he's never eaten anything unclean. Um, he would have known just immediately looking at these animals, wait a second, that, I can't eat that. I can't eat that. But, you know, you just told me to, to kill these animals and eat them. Uh, for Peter, this would have violated something that he had lived out um, as absolute right his entire life. You know, we read that and we're, we kind of think, okay, you know, what's kind of the big deal? For Peter, this was something that was like, he had, he had, like I said, he had lived this, he had breathed it his whole life. This was something you just didn't do. And for him, it, uh, it, it would have been hard to fathom, what are you asking me to do? I, I can't touch that. Like that, that's against everything I've ever believed in. You, you know what I mean? Like this is very difficult. Um, I uh, this is this is nowhere near the extent of this. But uh, we were out in Africa one time, and uh, you know, there's no utensils in Africa. You know, you don't you don't have forks and knives and all that. They they you have a plate and you have rice and you know, some vegetables or whatever, and you're just, you know, you're, you're eating it. Well, they, <clears throat> they had a, uh, they had a meal, sort of a special meal, and they made these, this delicious, what we would call soup beans here. If you're, you know, from West Virginia or Kentucky, these were just good old soup beans and they were good, but they, they had the rice and they, they put it on my plate and then they poured these soup beans over the rice. And you know, soup beans are a little sticky and they're runny and it's in the rice and there's other stuff. And I, they're just, you know, scooping it and, you know, going like this. And f for everything, I mean, I, I, I could not overcome in my mind how to, I mean, I, if, if I had done that, I think I would have had a, had a, you know, a gag reflex actually. Just, it was beyond, what my normal was used to, if that makes sense. And I, I actually, I mean, I felt kind of embarrassed. I was just kind of sitting there holding my plate because it, it just, I couldn't do it. It was against my, like my normal thought process. And finally, uh, Jonathan, the, the, our host uh, over there noticed, he went back in the kitchen and got one of their big serving spoons, like a big ladle. And, I, <laughs> and I'm sitting there 
you know, and I finally started eating. But when I was reading that and thinking about what Peter's feeling or reaction, that experience of mine came back and how it, it, it you know, there was nothing about that that, but, but it, it was just, so, it was in such opposition to what in my mind was acceptable. You know what I mean? Yeah, Debbie. Any bottom feeders, they will not. Oh, yeah. And they go right back to Leviticus 11. And they, they claim that. Yeah, they're, yeah, I can't remember which one it is. I know, I know, yeah. Um, so, yeah, and I think it's the same thing. If you were to, you know, they believe that so deeply and live it out. If you were to put a, bring them over and say, here's your lobster, they, I mean, it'd be to the point of offense, you know. It'd be like, what? So here's Peter. He's. He's looking at this and he's being told by who he knows is God to eat it. And I think it's just challenging everything about, uh, about what he has believed. So <clears throat> let's, uh, let's go ahead now. We're going to move into verse uh, 14 through 16. We're going to read these um, three verses here. And we're going to see Peter's sort of protest and we're going to see God's response and how he handles this. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. So, Peter here confirms what we had talked about earlier. Uh, he stated that he's never eaten anything uh, that was not, you know, considered ceremonially clean by the Levitical law. Um, <clears throat> in fact, when we look at the uh, the context behind, we see uh, the the way that this is structured is his rejection was quite pronounced almost to the point uh, that he's offended and is rebuking it. I mean, when we look at, th at that sentence structure, um, surely not, Lord. He wasn't asking a question, surely not. He's surely not, Lord. You know, like, I, I'm not going to do that. Almost, um, it's interesting because, you know, back when uh, we were at the Last Supper, and Peter's there, and, and, you know, Jesus is talking about what's going to happen. He says, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to go and die or whatever. And, and he says, no, you know, that will not happen. And what does Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan, right? You know, there's, uh, there's this, there's this uh, denial of what he's saying. So this is a strong reaction. And I think given his... Um, you know, the same way when, when I'm eating, trying to eat that food with my hands, yeah. it's a strong emotion that's being elicited here. Like, you're asking me to do something that's violating the God that I, I love. And he also then confirms, I've never eaten this. So we can see the, the seriousness with, uh, with how he takes obedience to God. You know, this, this was not an option. This was a lifestyle, like I'm living my life. So he, he had a deep, a deep and uh, um, uh, fortified sense of obedience to God. But something happens. The voice spoke back to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. <clears throat> so... Peter, this probably even intensifies his confusion even more. Um, again, you know, something that he had known and believed as being unclean is now being stated um, as being cleaned. And that word made clean, uh, katharizo, K-A-T-H-A, K-A-T-H-A-R-I, Z O. That's actually an I, not a very good I. Catharizo. Um, <clears throat> Catharizo uh, is defined like this: in a moral sense, 
to be made free from the defilement of sin and from faults and be taken to purity, to be free from wickedness, the guilt of sin, to purify, to consecrate, and to be cleaned, uh, to be dedicated or pronounced clean by Levitical law. So this, the use of this word and the very specific meaning behind it, there would have been, there could, there can now be no doubt in Peter's mind as to what the Spirit, Holy Spirit was actually saying to him. That it, it wasn't that there weren't uh, clean and unclean animals here according to the, to the Levitical law. The truth is that even the unclean things have now been made clean. They've been brought from a state of uncleanliness to a state of purity so that now they are acceptable under Levitical law. So, <clears throat> um, so Peter here, I, I think, is he's starting to wrestle with this even more. Um, and we're starting to see the deep symbolism uh, coming out of, of, what, uh, of what's being transferred, what's being communicated to Peter and now, you know, to now to us. Um, <clears throat> because what? We, we were unclean. We were defiled by sin. We were those unclean things. And, and God has now pronounced us as being clean because we've been washed by the blood of Christ. So, um, uh, so there, that this intense symbolism is starting to, we're starting to see some of that now. Uh, to continue on, though, the Lord repeats this a third time. Well, we obviously know for Peter, repetitions of three have a meaning to him. You know, he, he denied Jesus three times. Jesus predicted that. He told him that this is what was going to happen. He denied him three times. And of course, after Jesus was uh, resurrected, he came back then to affirm Jesus three times, uh, spoke to him with the same thing three times. So here's the Lord once again repeating something, confirming something to him for a third time. Um, you know, it's almost like we can kind of, for Peter, I think this is almost like one of those little, like, love language things. I, you know, that's what I'm, I'm looking at it. You know, there are things that... Uh, I will do or say uh, for Coria that for somebody else might not, you might not realize that has a meaning, but when I do it, there's, there's something else there. She knows my heart behind it. And, and I, I, I have the, a thought that maybe one of the reasons why Jesus in this text does this three times because it's kind of like, you know, that wink to him. It's, it's me, Peter, you know, and uh, you, you need to listen to what I say, just like before when I, you know, confirmed you. So that, that repetition of three, I think, is very important for Peter. After the command was issued a third time, it says that the, the sheet was taken back up into heaven and the vision ended. <clears throat> now, this vision probably... It, was no more than a, a you know a couple minutes long. It 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 you know there, this wouldn't have taken hours to transpire. It wasn't like you know the the revelation or anything like that where you know it, it's it's a this long thing. But in these couple minutes, the Holy Spirit I think is communicating something to Peter that um, goes way beyond as I said at the beginning what is okay to eat and what is not okay to eat. In fact, it had nothing really to do with the Levitical law in chapter 11 of Leviticus. It wasn't a teaching about food. It was an indication, I think, of, of sort of this, that the spiritual barriers that, that once existed had been torn down. That veil had been torn. There was no longer, you know, Jew who, who was clean and Gentile who was unclean. That that had been, that barrier that separated us had been destroyed. 
Um, <clears throat> and Peter, you know, he has this vision, but he noticed the vision said nothing to him about what happened at Cornelius' house. Peter, at this time, unless something happened that wasn't documented, he has no clue that there are men actually that were dispatched yesterday uh, because somebody else was spoken to. God spoke to somebody else. He has no idea that, that this, this is like visions at a perfect time. So right after something's going to happen, God's already set a, a, you know, a, a thing into motion that's going to perfectly tie into this vision. And so again, we see this plan and this purpose and this coordination behind what God is doing in our life and the words that he speaks to us. You know, uh, he, he tells us something and, and so often we, we want to, uh, we want to relate it with what happening, what's happening right now. You know, this has to be related to this. And, um, I know there, there are things that, uh, Corey and I have felt the Lord speak to us in visions that we have written down. We still have no idea what that even means. You know what I mean? It's, it's like, it, it doesn't fit anything with what's going on right now. And yet we've also seen visions where we've, we have no idea. And then suddenly it happens. You know what I mean? You're, you're speaking to somebody and they start saying something and you're just like, you know, you, you get that quickening, the hair stand up and the Holy Spirit says, Remember that? And, and you start to share this vision and suddenly they're crying and it's like, wow, you know, God, God gave me that three years ago, knowing that right now I would be standing in front of you and that was exactly what you needed to hear or vice versa or whatever. And you're like, I, I have just been used in the service of the King of Kings to do his work. Like, who am I, Lord, to be trusted to do your work, you know? And, and, and so I think this, this story is painting this just tremendous picture of uh, God teaching a truth to Peter that, we are, that we're still learning and, uh, and experiencing today, the freedom that comes um, uh, from the blood of Christ, you know, and the relationship that we can have with him and with each other as a result of it. So with that said, we've got, we'll have about five, six minutes here for questions. Let's, um, let's go ahead and close in prayer, and then we'll go into that. Father, we just are so blessed by you today, Lord. We are so blessed to know, <clears throat> Father, that the same way that, uh, that Peter, all those years ago, uh, didn't even know that these men were coming, Lord, Peter would have had no idea that, that 2,000 years later, we would be standing here talking about it still. Father, you knew even then that this was for us today. And Father, your plan is perfect, and we trust you. And, and Lord, we, we lift the rest of this service up to you today. We ask for your voice to speak uh, through Pastor Tim. Father, we ask for, for an anointing to be on these young children as they come to sing and present uh, a program about you. Father, may every single person be blessed by the presence of your Holy Spirit today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right.